Good morning, good morning. Sunny morning, cloudy morning actually. That's just a very small pocket in the cloud that's allowed the sun to shine through. It's almost like God is trying to cheer me up. Let me just uh, use my meat base window uh, opener and uh, mirror retractor. Seeing as we're on the road of death now, this some for some reason these lorries have decided that this is a shortcut. And uh, I think, uh, I mean, obviously it always was a shortcut. It's not like the road's moved. But uh, what's happened is that uh, just more and more people are being sent down here, probably by Google Maps or see this uh, passing places. You see what a shocking state the edge of the road is, yeah? It's like they, they're using an extra two feet of the road over the field, the lorries, because they can't pass each other. This is this is new, this is just this year they've done that. There's tire tracks all over the verge. And this road is the, this bend, is the worst bend on the entire road. You see here there's another unofficial passing place, there's another unofficial passing place. Look at the state of the verges, yeah, and then find a lorry that will come flying around here. One's just pushed me off the road the other day. Anyway, perhaps they don't start till nine. It's only half seven, half eight. Another ultra wide car. How are you? All right, all right. The, uh, the snowflake generation, I've said is not fit to be called the snowflake generation anymore because they don't actually have the resilience of a snowflake. I mean, it's the snowflake does arrive intact and can survive a storm. Whereas this generation wants uh, they want to be, each one of them wants to be the only person on earth. The latest uh, controversy is about a 33 year old woman who was attacked, or I assume she was attacked anyway. She was abducted walking home late at night in London and uh, turned up dead in a forest or some, wood, some woods near Ashford in Kent. And uh, police officer who lives in Deal has been arrested and uh, presumably uh, was working in London and uh, could have done it on his way home but we don't know he could be completely innocent but the fact that he's a serving metropolitan police officer has caused a lot of concern whereas instead of so so supposing you've got a woman who's been abducted and murdered and a suspect who's a Metropolitan Police Officer where do you think the media's gone with this? Do you think they've gone with um, we should make the streets of London safer? Well they, they have to a certain extent they haven't gone with the uh, we should find out whether we've got a load of sex maniacs working in the Met. That angle's been sort of strangely forgotten. And uh, the suggestion, the only suggestion I've heard is from a Green Party peer in the House of Lords, who, as Mrs Angry said, is in her, in her hundreds, uh, who suggested that oh, there should be a curfew on men being allowed out after six o'clock, uh, 6 p.m., I mean, that's the quality of the debate. But it's strangely consistent in a way because of the fact, you know, the way I've described that people believe that they're not safe from COVID until everybody's been vaccinated. In other words, the last person's not safe until everybody's safe. 
well they're not safe until everybody's safe and yet uh, and and so that sort of now flowed into this uh, narrative that no woman is safe until all the men are locked up you know people say asinine things like most women are murdered by men most murders are committed by men etc etc so so the problem is men whereas the problem is not men the problem is random men who turn out to be capable of killing people and there's not really been a massive call for research into uh, why people become killers or serial killers although I'm sure there is a big body of research into it but I mean it doesn't really seem to be getting us any closer to the department of pre-crime where we can tell in advance who's going to go because it's a bit like being struck by lightning isn't it you know, if there's a group of you out hiking and one of you gets struck by lightning, there's a lot of survivor's guilt going on. There's a lot of, oh, if we hadn't gone that route or if we hadn't gone up that hill or if we'd taken shelter or if we'd been walking in a different order, you know, it, then so-and-so wouldn't have got killed. It, it wouldn't have happened. And I don't think there's much to be... Uh, gained by that you know these things are a bit as I say they're a bit like lottery wins in reverse you can to a certain extent uh, you know uh, a, a good a friend of I mean a, a husband of a good friend of mine was killed uh, on, a, on his boat and I believe it or not for someone who's got a motorcycle license and a pilot's license I have actually got a very low risk for tolerance. Tolerance for risk. Oh, hello. Let's uh, pop my wing wearers out. Just in case. So, and that's why I've never really had a I mean, I did have some accidents on the motorbike, but nothing ever really serious. Never broke a bone or ended up in hospital or anything. Just mainly fell off and scratched the bike. And certainly in the uh, 30 years I've been flying light aircraft, I've never had an accident. No, <coughs> no accident at all, really. I mean can't afford to uh, have accidents in light aircraft, they tend to be fatal. <laughs> you, get, you get two groups of pilots, those who can tell you that they've never had an accident and those who can't tell you anything. <laughs> so, I suppose that's survivor's bias, that is. <laughs> but, I would, I would probably not be happy going out, you know, with a, on a boat. I don't know. I don't know whether a boat's necessarily more dangerous than an airplane. What happened was he was he was fishing. He pulled in a net. The net got caught on something, and the net, the, the winch sunk the boat. And that's a that's a difficult lesson to learn, isn't it? You know, it's one of those things that the first time it happens to you, you've, you've had it. Unless you've got a, you know, you're wearing a decent life jacket and you've got a personal locator beacon. And certainly when I fly over water in the plane, I have all of those things. This is, so what you do is you reduce your risk, that's what I'm trying to say. It depends on your risk appetite. Um, I mean, there was, I, I qualified in London and there were some places in the late 70s where I wouldn't go, uh, certainly after dark, and by the time I sort of uh, was working for the GDPA in the mid 80s, 90s, um, those places didn't exist anymore, you know, they'd been designed out of London, and mainly because there was a massive influx of, of people. Um, 
you know, which meant that if you're going to murder someone, you'd, you'd find it quite hard to find a quiet spot. But um, but no, I mean, you know, you you, you do you have to take uh, responsibility for your own level of risk. In the same way as with COVID, you know, you have to decide for yourself whether you're going to stay at home, whether you're going to get out of bed, whether you're going to wear a mask, if you're going to go down the supermarket, are you going to go down the pub, would you sit in a cinema, you know, would you go to a club? All of these increasing levels of risk that you have to decide for yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think it's the same when you're just in life in general you know and that includes walking about that includes walking home after you've been somewhere you know you you decide on what your level of risk is now I'm not saying that just because you decide to adopt a high level of risk or indulge in risky behaviour that you are inviting what might happen to you or that you're careless or um uh that you don't, uh, you know, that you're in any way culpable for anything that might that someone else might do, any violence that someone else might perpetrate against you. But I'm just saying, you have to. At the end of the day, you, it's in your power to decide what level of risk you wish to adopt. And if you do decide to indulge in risky practices, then, and you roll the dice and lose, then. You're not culpable in a way, but it's just a consequence, isn't it, of a decision that you made and that you you reconcile to yourself in advance, but then try and try and say that you weren't reconciled to after the event. And as humans, we're very, very poor at uh, uh, judging risks, which are very, very consequential, but very, very rare. You know. This is why we don't have, we generally don't have a bathtub full of water and a, a, you know, and a garage full of tin food and nobody buys a generator, Uh, you know, those sort of people are looked upon as a bit kooky because what they're doing is they're planning for something that would be quite severe if it happened but it's only got a one in a million chance. See the lorries on the uh, horizon there, that's Manston. They're all waiting to queue to get down to Dover. I don't know what they're, yeah. That might be where they come out onto the onto the road. You'll see them all in a minute. Here they are. Well, here's one anyway. Yeah, so what we do, we're far better off sort of uh, dealing with everyday risks, such as, you know, should I pull out and overtake, or uh, should I knock off uh, work 10 minutes early, what's the chances of my boss finding me, those sort of things. Things that are pretty inconsequential, but we encounter on a day-to-day basis. But your actual alien invasion, or zombie apocalypse, or... uh, or earthquake, tornado, whatever, unless, you know, in in an area where they're not common. Um, We just tend to cross our fingers and hope it doesn't happen. And then sometimes it does. So I feel uh, obviously very uh, sorry for this young girl and her family. Young woman. But I don't know, I just don't know whether campaigning, you know, all these men are beating their breasts about how can we make you feel safer? How can we make women feel safer? I don't think we can make women feel safer. I don't think we should want to make women feel safer, in a way. I think if we make women feel safer, they'll they'll end up adopting more risk. It's like the old um, argument with the seatbelts. If you're driving along a car, uh, driving a car along in traffic, and you don't have a seatbelt, the argument is that you might be a bit more cautious. You know, you might might try a bit harder to stay away from the other cars and 
perhaps drive a bit slower. Whereas if you had a massive great steel spike on the on the steering wheel, which was certain to impale you and kill you if you had an accident, uh, <coughs> any type of accident, <coughs> you'd you'd creep along. So, uh, but by putting a seat belt on someone, what you're doing is you're um, you're causing them to drive faster. You know, you might encourage someone to, to take more risk with a seat belt. They might think, oh well, I'm I'm packed in now, like an egg in an egg box. I've got my airbag in front of me. I've got my seat belt around me. You know, so what if I'm doing 80 in the wet? Yeah, difficult. But. Uh, these decisions are always, you know, they're all just inspect, looked at through the old retrospectoscope, you know, perhaps she should have got a taxi home, why didn't somebody she was visiting arrange to walk her home, but, you know, they are, I've seen a fair degree of reckless behaviour in young women, they can be, uh, sort of flaunt their vulnerability in a way, you know, they can believe that they're vulnerable when they're not anyway there's nothing dental really in that was there so I'll flag that up I'll put nothing dental in the description but it was more um, it's more about the uh, inspection testing and compliance culture that's really just uh, when Piers Morgan's gone you know the guy who I was complaining about the other day he ended up being cancelled, uh, at least temporarily anyway. <clears throat> like I say, he was the one who uh, was pioneering this approach that nobody's safe until the last person's vaccinated. And now we've got to a point where no woman is safe until the last person is, last man really, is, uh, is locked up. But we've been through it, As we men, we men have been through this before been through it before. I've been through all the men are rapists before. And that was what they said in The Guardian this morning. All men are rapists, basically, or at least women don't know which men are rapists, and so what they have to do is they have to treat all men as if they were rapists, um, which is the same thing as saying all men are rapists, potential rapists. And, it, you know, it's cyclical. It's I think as uh, people forget that we've had this debate over the millennia and uh, so it's just time to rehearse it all again but the trouble is we never learn and it's all just the same old stupidity that it was the last time uh, anyway that's what the chatterati are chatting about right Friday morning only I'll uh, talk to you soon bye